As far as I'm concerned, there's some fool's gold on the waiver wire this week, as there always is in week one, right? It's it's when we have so many moving parts and then we feel like we got clarity after one week. But there's always these these reactions to week one. They're not justified. There are these performances that are not justified. I'm looking at you, Sammy Watkins. So what we're going to do today is look at all the players available on the waiver wire. And let your idiot league mates waste their fab, waste their number one waiver wire pick on the dudes sitting there rotting away. And then we'll talk about the dudes that you should actually be targeting. And we're going to try something a little bit different today, all right? I, I don't think I've seen this done before on Fantasy YouTube, and it's not really like groundbreaking, but the presentation of how we're going to do it's going to be a little bit different. Normally, I just sit here and fucking yap, 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 and yell at you the entire video. So rather than me yapping about it, why don't we tuck our shirts in and get into it? So I need y'all to let me know if you like this format better than like normal waiver wire videos. And, and the format is basically this. I'm on Sleeper. I'm in my redraft league right now. And there's a trending tab up here, right? And again, this is the Sleeper platform. If any of you guys have questions about that or only use like Yahoo, ESPN, NFL. Most of my leagues are done on Sleeper. They have the trending tab up here, which pretty much tells you the guys who are the most popular waiver wire pickups for the week and who's being added right now the volume of them being added, what percentage they're rostered. And I feel like this is more helpful to you guys if I go down this list and kind of talk about each player. This way I hit on really, this way I hit on smaller leagues, right? Ones where there's like guys that are 7% owned, 2% owned. And then we hit on bigger leagues too a little bit where there's Jacoby Myers is 52% owned. And I kind of feel like it's probably more visually appealing and it helps you guys. And we're, we're able to like click on the player and also see their upcoming schedule and shit like that. So rather than just telling you my favorite guys, to go after and pick up. I'm kind of giving analysis on every player on this list. And I'm going to try to keep them bite-sized. I'm going to kind of try to keep them minimal so that this video is not 87 hours long. So the most popular pickup of the week, without a doubt, is Puka Nakua, the rookie out of BYU. If you've watched our videos over the last couple of weeks, you probably already own him. You probably stashed him before the season start. Big dub for BDG right there. Puka went crazy week one. 15 targets, 10 catches, 119 yards the big elephant in the room here is cooper cups obviously out so puka just like filled in and played that role for him so cooper cup is on the ir which means he has to miss four weeks that doesn't mean he's only missing four weeks we don't know maybe he comes back in week five but maybe he comes back in week six or seven or eight or maybe he comes back in week five and then re-injures his hamstring again we don't know when he's going to come back but there are not good vibes out of la camp you don't go and fly across country and see second and third and fourth fucking specialists everywhere if you're not overly concerned. The reason you do that is probably because your team doctors gave you an extremely like serious diagnosis, okay? And you want to make sure or confirm that what they're saying is true. So if the Rams got to choose, you know, how long of an IR sin he could be on, it could be eight weeks for all we know. We don't know, but the IR stint is four weeks, so that is what he got. Puka is going to be a part of this offense regardless of when Cooper Cup comes back. The way I would look at it now is almost like, okay, Cooper Cup comes back. If Cooper even starts to eat a little bit, Puka will probably just play the Robert Woods role, right? And that, that role is not 15 targets a game, but it's still eight targets a game and probably like six catches for 65 yards, a touchdown. Every Robert Woods is great. He was a top 24 wide receiver when he's in LA. So I'm actually looking at Puka in borderline the same vein. Think of it, Cooper Cup, Puka's Robert Woods, and then Tutu Atwell's like the Brandon Cooks. He's like the deep threat down the field. So Puka, without a doubt, is my number one waiver wire pickup on the week. And I would spend upwards of, you know, 20 to 25% of my fat bid on him. Then we got a huge grouping of running backs. Justice Hill, Kyron Williams, Josh Kelly, Gus Edwards, Kenneth Gainwell. All of them, for the most part, owned in sub 10% of leagues. So I'll give you the breakdown for Baltimore running backs. J.K. Dobbins obviously tears his Achilles. He is out for the season, which means somebody's going to do something in the Baltimore backfield. We don't necessarily know who it is. I have an inkling it's going to be Justice Hill. They're going to call Melvin Gordon up from the practice squad. I'm not going to like get into theory and, and start making up fake rumors and, and sources and shit on whether or not Jonathan Taylor gets moved there or whatever. When that happens, we will cross that bridge. All right. So for right now, we're assuming Melvin Gordon gets called up. We're assuming Justice Hill and Gus Edwards are on the team, obviously. When J.K. Dobbins left yesterday, Justice Hill had 19 snaps to Gus Edwards is 15. Justice Hill got both goal line carries in the first half, converted 
two of them for two touchdowns. He went eight for nine on the ground, which is abysmal. But I am of the belief, and I have been of the belief over the entirety of the summer, that Gus Edwards is pretty much dust at this point. I, it's very easy to look back at 24, 25, 26-year-old Gus Edwards and be like, oh, those five yards per carry, when everybody in that backfield is running for five yards per carry. He's not 25-year-old Gus Edwards. He is now 28-and-a-half-year-old Gus Edwards coming off of still an ACL tear, right? When it happens later in the career, it's just harder to get back to the form that you once had with Gus Edwards. I also want to drop this other fucking stat. Gus Edwards has not caught a regular season pass since 2020. He hasn't caught a pass since 2020. Justice Hill is younger. He's more explosive. He is a better pass catcher, and they just used him on the goal line. I'd like to say like Gus Edwards will be the short yardage back. Do we even feel confident that that's going to happen? So I'm not necessarily saying that Justice Hill is going to be a top 24 running back for the remainder of the year going forward, and I feel confident in it. But if I'm taking a swing on one of the backs in Baltimore, it is for sure Justice Hill. He was the dude in preseason. When J.K. Dobbins was obviously playing most of the run with the starters, the next back in with the starters was Justice Hill every time. It was never Gus Edwards. Gus Edwards was getting in there with the second stringers, third quarter, fourth quarter. We've seen weird things happen, but I would much rather have Justice Hill than Gus Edwards. Gus Edwards feels like fool's gold. Gus Edwards feels like the dude you let your, your league mates drop 10, 15, 25% of their fab on. Let him go. Let him go. Isn't that from a Disney movie? So I am, I'm going after Justice Hill. I'm not going to break the bank. I think I would probably throw somewhere from, you know, 10 to 15% of my fab on him. I mean, we've seen Baltimore running backs have success. Regard Kenyon Drake, Latavius Murray, Devonta Freeman, obviously J.K. Dobbins. Gus, like the, the list of guys who have had success in this backfield because Lamar Jackson is their quarterback. It's a long list. It's CVS receipt type beat. So give me Justice Hill. I don't want I would actually rather throw a 0% fab bid on Melvin Gordon than on Gus Edwards. That's the way I'm looking at it. Kyron Williams dominated snaps for LA. This I'm not going to say it came out of nowhere because we did start hearing reports towards the end of the summer that Kyron Williams was going to be a factor in the short yardage situation-ish, but it was, it, w it was not pretty for Cam Akers. Kyron Williams, 15 carries, 65% of the snaps, 52 yards on the ground, scored the two touchdowns. I will say I'm not overly optimistic about his season-long projections. I don't know how often they're going to give him the ball on the goal line. I don't know how often they're going to be on the goal line. Stafford looked great, don't get me wrong, and this Rams team looks like it's going to be better than most people projected it to be. But I think if you take away the touchdowns, you're not overly happy about Kyron Williams, which is obviously a big piece of what he did in fantasy, but wasn't really catching passes, although he is a fantastic pass catcher. He's also a very good pass blocker, even though he's undersized. Coming out, he was one of the best pass blockers in his class. Cam Akers did have 22 carries, but most of that came in garbage time. It just seems like McVay don't like Cam Akers right now. So Kyron Williams is a dude that, like, it's cool. I guess you could pick him up, but I don't really know how often I'm going to feel comfortable starting him. Like, there's no chance I'm starting him next week against San Fran. Don't really want to start him against Cincinnati. At Indy, yeah, maybe. Philadelphia, probably not. I mean, there are games, obviously, but, like, Kyron Williams feels a little bit like Kenneth Gainwell, where when you look at the overlying picture, it's not, it's not great. It's fun to see what he did in week one, but I just don't see a lot of longevity. I don't see a player that we're going to feel comfortable putting into our lineups consistently. So Kyron Williams is a dude I'm not necessarily avoiding on the waiver wire this week, but I wouldn't really throw more than like 5% of my fab on him. Josh Kelly, Joshua, Joshua, Joshua Kelly is my number one waiver wire pickup of the week at the running back position. The Chargers run blocking unit is awesome. Kellen Moore very clearly wants to run the ball and run the ball and run the ball. In week one, they were the number one team in the NFL in terms of neutral game script. So when it wasn't out of hand, when they weren't up big or weren't down big, which is pretty much the entire game of the Miami Chargers game, the Chargers ran the ball on 67% of their neutral game script snaps. Teams with Herbert are not going to want to beat them deep. They played cover two the whole game, which means the middle is open for the taking. You you use that with a run blocking line. Josh Kelly looks explosive for the first time in probably his career. Eckler's been dying for a secondary back. And not to mention Eckler apparently fucked up his ankle a little bit. We don't know how serious it is. It doesn't feel that serious because I feel like there was no real ramifications or any word of it until like a couple days later. But Josh Kelly is going to be a part of this backfield throughout the entire year. So I think he's got standalone value. I think he's a guy who can get work on the goal line, you know, maybe 50-50 split there. And I think that if Eckler's actually banged up or if he gets banged up at any point, Josh Kelly becomes like an immediate top 15 fantasy running back in that Chargers offense. So Kelly's a dude that I would really go in on 15 to 20% of my of my budget right now. We touched on Kenneth Gainwell for a second. Now, Kenneth Gainwell came out and just like randomly dominated snaps in this backfield. 62% of the snaps gave a little bit to DeAndre Swift, gave a little bit to Boston Scott. DeAndre Swift had one carry to Kenneth Gainwell's 14 
carries. Kenneth Gainwell also had four targets, four catches, 20 yards here. So he got a ton of touches. But again, like I did a full recap video of game by game highlights and stuff for fantasy yesterday. That was a stream we did and we do every Monday. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel. If you want to check those out, go check that video out. But I talked about Kenneth Gainwell kind of at length. Gainwell, even like he, he's just a dude that he'll continue to rack up touches in this offense if they continue to feed him the ball. But he never really does anything with him. His like yards after contact is miserable. His yards per reception, even though he's a great pass catcher, seem always to be extremely on the low end. So Kenneth Gainwell, to me, he's a dude that I'll, I'll try to pick up. I'll throw, you know, 5 to 7% of the budget on. He's also apparently a little bit banged up. He was on the injury report with ribs. But, like, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday reports don't matter much, except for this week, given the fact that they play on Thursday Night Football against Minnesota. So if there was a week that DeAndre Swift does get back into the rotation, this would be it. I also wouldn't you know, drop Rashad Penny just yet. I'd like to see one more week if he's a healthy scratch again. Yeah, you can definitely get him off your roster. But I think a lot of this had to do with the fact that they were playing in New England. It was shitty weather and they wanted a guy out there that they could trust. And I think that was a lot of it. And Kenneth Gainwell, like regardless of playing this much, he just isn't uh, a great fantasy asset because he doesn't he, he does the least with all the opportunities he gets. So if he was racking up, you know, 50 receiving yards on his four or five targets, I'd look at this a little bit differently. But if you're not in a full PPR league, he's probably going to be a waste of a spot in your starting lineup. So not an ultimate fade for me, but like I don't think what we saw in week one is actually going to be what we see throughout the entirety of the year. Interesting that Kendrick Bourne was the second most popular waiver ad this week behind Puka. Kendrick Bourne played... 91% of the snaps. He ran the most routes on the New England Patriots, which was kind of interesting, but he did not run them from the slot. I think we think of Kendrick Bourne as a slot receiver, but he's 6'1", 205. He's had these moments where he kind of blows up each year and people get excited about it, but Juju was pretty much benched. He ran as many routes and had as many as many snaps as the hyped up rookie Demario Douglas. So I'd keep an eye on that that dude in much deeper leagues. But Kendrick Bourne seems to be a playmaker. Devontae Parker was out for this game, but Again, like 11 targets. I think Mac threw the ball like 45 times, which is not something we're going to expect going forward. Kendrick Bourne's cool. He's he's an ad. I, I just, again, don't really know if we're ever going to feel confident having him in our lineup. So he's like a 3%, 3 to 5% guy in PPR leagues. Moving down the list, we have Tyler Argier. He, I mean, he's owned in 60% of leagues. I can't imagine anyone who's in a serious league uh, has him unowned. He is obviously someone that should be owned because the Falcons run defense or the Falcons run offenses unstoppable. Hayden Hurst was like the tight end two on the week as Hunter Henry was the tight end one. The one thing I will say, like, so when it comes to the tight ends, I tweeted this out yesterday. OK, this was this was one of the all time worst weeks at tight end fantasy ever. OK, uh, Kelsey was out and Andrews was out, obviously, which is why that happened. There were six tight end touchdowns this week in fantasy football, six only throughout every single tight end in the league, six scored touchdowns of the six touchdown scorers. They were the tight end one, two, three, four, five five and nine in fantasy football. Hunter Henry also led all, he was one of the six guys that scored a touchdown and led all tight ends with 56 receiving yards, okay? So what I want you to do is take the touchdowns out of your mindset and then say, do I still want this guy? Hayden Hurst is probably gonna be a dude who runs a lot of routes. He's probably gonna be one of the main safety receivers for Bryce Young, so he's fine. Hunter Henry, he's kind of cool as well, I guess. But again, Devontae Parker was out. Mac Jones threw the ball a shit ton, and Hunter Henry only had six targets. So maybe he's like a staple of that offense, but they're not necessarily dudes. Like, when I'm looking at tight ends to pick up, realistically, the ones I'm looking at, I don't even know if they're on this goddamn list, are dudes like Zach Ertz all the way down here. You know why? Because he's playing on 80% of the snaps, 10 targets in this one. He was targeted so, so heavily. He didn't do anything with him. He caught six passes for 21 yards. He's literally like averaging 0.2 yards per route run. But I want to look at usage, not touchdowns, because one is more predictable than the other. So I'm looking at dudes like Zach Ertz at tight end. I'm even looking at dudes like Logan Thomas. Oh, he's on this list. Here we go. Logan Thomas, 82% snap guy in an offense. Like I'd much rather invest in the Washington offense, passing offense, than the Arizona passing offense. So Thomas played on 82% of the snaps here. Saw eight targets. The eight targets were a team high. Thomas was a dude who had a nice little run in fantasy a couple of years ago when he was healthy. So if he's healthy right now, he's probably going to get some good usage. And I think he could probably put you up like seven to eight fantasy points per game in PPR leagues, which at this point is like you fucking you'll open that with welcome arms. I said that backwards. You'll welcome that with open arms, pit stanking and everything. So as we continue to move down the list, we have Rashad Shahid, who had a ball out game for the Saints in this one, only played 54% of the snaps. That That's kind of my one problem is like he still 
He looked great, actually, though. He, he actually looked like a really good ball player. Six targets, five catches, 89 yards, 17.8 yards per catch, scored the touchdown. He looked like a real good field stretcher for the Saints. Now, again, this is something I brought up in the stream yesterday. They played against the Titans, who allowed the single most passing yards per game last year. They're a very bad pass defense. So I want to see Derek Carr sling it not against the Saints. They play Carolina, who's a better pass defense. They get better pass rush. Green Bay, Tampa Bay, New England. So they get some real some real defenses over the next few weeks. So I want to see how he fares. But he's still very much the number three in the pecking order behind Chris Olave. Michael Thomas is running a lot of the routes on the outside. Rashid Shaheed comes in on three wide receiver sets. So he is, he is a star in three wide receiver sets. But playing 54% of the snaps is not very predictable. He's a 2 to 3% fab guy for me. Same thing with Tutu Atwell. Uh, I mean... I don't know, dude, 165 pounds could could play the Brandon Cooks role. But like, I don't know what else. Jacoby. So Jacoby's 52 percent rostered. If he is available in your league, he needs to be a priority pickup. It took him four years to score two touchdowns in New England. It took him two quarters to do it in Las Vegas over the weekend. This dude is very clearly the wide. We, we undervalued him all summer. Everybody did. Everyone kind of wrote him off. We're like, he's too boring. He's whatever. The Raiders passing offense is going to be terrible. Devontae is going to take 1,000 targets. Jacoby is that dude in this offense behind Devontae Adams. In matchups where, like we saw this week, where Patrick Sertain was a smothering Devontae Adams, he had to go somewhere else with the ball. And it was Jacoby Myers, man. He seems like he is... Absolutely, the two the 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 target funnel in in L in LV is going to be Devonte Adams, Jacoby Myers, Devonte Adams, Jacoby Myers. So Jacoby Myers does not feel fluky whatsoever. He feels like he's been a dude who has just been good at producing year in and year out now in the NFL. And the New England Patriots passing offense is one that just like you just go to die there with Tom Brady not there. So Jacoby, I, I would put I would put a nice like seven to ten percent fab bid on him. Oh, and how can we leave out the quarterback position? Uh, I feel for the Jets fans, man. I feel for the Jets fans. You guys should trade for Desmond Ritter for sure. You guys should for sure give us a first rounder for Desmond Ritter. So Aaron Rodgers lost for the season. Zach Wilson for now will be their quarterback. Let him let him to a victory last night against Buffalo. Electric game, obviously. In Superflex Leagues, obviously this is concerning to Superflex Leagues. This is only relating to Superflex Leagues. Zach Wilson was most likely available in your Superflex League right now if you're a redraft team. I'm not breaking... I don't don't care how bad you need a quarterback. I'm not breaking the bank for uh, Zach Wilson here because a lot of the times he's actually just throwing up like 10 fantasy points and you could probably find that on the waiver wire. Like mo- more often than not, I'm probably more comfortable throwing like Jacoby Myers into my lineup than I am Zach Wilson. Next week against Dallas, he will not, he might be one of 32 starting quarterbacks. I'm not even ranking him in, inside my top 32 quarterbacks. New England, fuck no. KC, softer defense, but like no. Denver, tough. Philly, tough. Bye. Like, brother, my brother in Christ. Schedule down here is nice. Miami, Atlanta, Houston, Miami, Washington, Cleveland. I guess 16, 17 is tough, but, like, not bad down there. So, I don't know. If you really need a QB in a super flex league, I'm, don't don't put more than, like, 10%, 12% fab on, on Zach Wilson, please. And you're definitely not picking him up in one quarterback leagues. But in one quarterback leagues, let's talk about some QBs. Let's talk about Jordan Love, who was the only QB this week to throw for three touchdown passes and had zero interceptions doing so. Did it on 27 attempts. 245 yards, added 12 yards on the ground, a little shake and bake action. This passing offense is going to be great when Christian Watson is back. When they have all their weapons at full health, I don't know when that's going to be because Christian Watson's obviously out with the hamstring. Romeo Dobbs is dealing with the hamstring, although he played well, had a lot of fantasy points, only had like 25 receiving yards, so maybe the hamstring kind of hampered him. Uh, Jaden Reed is electric. Luke, Luke Musgrave looked good. Aaron Jones is fucking awesome in the receiving game, obviously, but he's dealing with a hamstring injury right now as well. So they got a lot of moving parts there. But what I do feel is that when they are at full strength, Jordan Love is going to be a top 15 fantasy quarterback. So between him and Brock Purdy, who is probably somewhere on this list, Brock Purdy, 222 touchdowns, also added 20 yards on the ground. Brock Purdy, underrated mover. Brock Purdy can move a little bit. He can scoot a little bit, man. He is uh he's underrated in that department. He is someone who can get outside the pocket and make plays doing that. And you just look at this goddamn offense, bro. Purdy throwing the ball to Kittle, C Mac, and Ayuk, who's a like a legit wide receiver one in the NFL. Debo Samuel, it's like you gotta be bad to fail in this offense. And Brock Purdy, I believe, is a minimum average quarterback, if not at this point above average as an NFL quarterback and actually like a good NFL QB. So Purdy and Jordan Love are for sure my targets that I feel like will be staples of your offense going forward. If you had, you know, if you had Aaron Rodgers in a one quarterback league and these guys are like the next two guys up, give me Brock Purdy, give me Jordan Love, 
I'll spend one quarterback leagues, you know, three to five percent. I'm not I'm not blowing the budget on uh, on one quarterback leagues, but I, I like those guys a lot. Who else we got down here? So we have Roshan Johnson, who had a really big game in this one, but most of that came in garbage time. There was a tweet from I think Hayden Winks of Underdog yesterday where he tweeted out the percentage of touches that came in garbage time for different running backs. And Roshan Johnson was the single highest player on that list. Ninety two percent of his touches came in garbage time that being said though he's a dude that over you know the course of the year should get more and more action in this offense because he continues to look good and better and better and better every time he steps on the field again though garbage time preseason with second stringers they still like Khalil Herbert they still like Don, uh, Deonta Foreman we don't know how good this this offense is going to be their offensive line is in shambles Justin Fields needs to get his shit together so Roshan fun for right now the box score tells you a little bit of different number than um then what the real game was like, they got down big, obviously, to Green Bay, and then it became the Roshan show. He did finish as, like, the RB11 on the week, which is wild. But, again, I, ju I just caution you not to, like, overspend. Although, I do think second half of the year, he could be a player for sure. Zay Jones is the GOAT. He's running in two wide receiver sets. I've been trying to tell you all that Zay Jones is this year's Zay Jones. He ran... 10 more routes than Christian Kirk did, bro. We're not dropping Kirk. Don't panic, panic, panic on Kirk. But Zay Jones absolutely needs to be owned. He is running. He ran as many routes as Calvin Ridley. He had one fewer route than Calvin Ridley did, okay? If you're doing that in a Trevor Lawrence-led offense, it's going to lead to fantasy points. Zay Jones is good, man. I can't, like, I don't know how many times I need to echo this, but 7-5, 55, and a touchdown. I think more, more weeks than not, he's going to give you double-digit fantasy points in PPR leagues. Not going to score every week, but on the weeks he does, he's going to give you 16, 17 points, and mwah. Romeo Dobbs is a must-add as well if he's sitting on your waiver wire for whatever fucking reason. Rennie's cool. I would take Nico Collins over him, though. Nico Collins had a really, really nice opening day here. Uh, 11 targets, 6 catches, 80 yards. Big target share there from C.J. Stroud. C.J. Stroud's going to get more and more comfortable as the year goes by. He did some good things. He did some bad things, but I feel, I feel confident enough in C.J. Stroud to know that he'll be able to um, at least – you know, sustain some drives, get the ball to the best playmakers on the offense. And it looks like it's Nico Collins for right now. So not a guy I'm uh, indulging on necessarily, but like 3% of the fab I'd be okay with. Allen Robinstein, here's the thing. Here's the thing. 90% of snaps, led the team in targets, five catches, 64 yards. Now, Deontay Johnson is likely going to be out this week, if not multiple weeks, with a hamstring injury. Allen Robinson's going to become a 100% snap player alongside George Pickett. Question becomes, now, Calvin Austin's out there, too. If he's if you're in a deeper league, Calvin Austin's like, cool, you're not going to feel comfortable throwing him into your lineup week one, and then by week two or three, Deontay Johnson might be back, and then Calvin Austin is bike on the bench. So I like Allen Robinson over Calvin Austin, absolutely, because we already know he's running 100% of the routes. They play against Cleveland, who can give up points against the slot for sure. How is Allen Robinson 94% rostered here? And he's on the top. Okay. I just realized, wait, it says 5% roster there. But when you click on it, it says 94%. I'm assuming Allen Robinson is available in most of y'all's redraft leagues. So go spend 5 7% on Allen Robinson and have a nice PPR play in your flex spot. Defensive pickups of the week. Uh, the Giants play against Arizona, which is obviously a juicy, juicy matchup. I think Brian Dable will get his, his crew in shape back together, ready to go. So the Giants at Arizona is a great one. Saints at Carolina is not bad. I don't, I don't love playing teams on the road unless they're like heavy favorites, but you know, you could definitely find worse matchups on the flip side. I'll run down this list really quickly and tell you whether or not I would drop these dudes. JK Dobbins, obviously Deion Jackson, you can get him all the way fuck off your roster and Rogers. Of course, Isaiah likely I would hold on to. I know he had a bad week one, but so did the entire Baltimore passing offense there. Isaiah Likely is a really talented dude. We don't know what the status is with Mark Andrews. I'm telling you, Isaiah Likely, he he will be okay if Andrews misses more time. Jefferson, I'm fine dropping. Sky Moore, I'd hold on to for another week or two. Rashad Penny, I would give him through Thursday Night Football to see if he gets activated and plays. Marvin Mims, uh, I never was a fan of him. I'm fine dropping him. He's running behind little Jordan Humphrey and some other like fake guys. Adam Thielen, you could drop. Shiggy, Shiggy I, I'd give one more week. He, he played a lot of the snaps and he ran a lot of routes and also would have had a 60-yard touchdown if Tannehill didn't overthrow him. Gerald Everett, you could definitely drop. Jalen Hyatt, I, I'd keep for one more week because they play Arizona. Jarek McKinnon, I would hold on to. Kadarius Tony is definitely a drop. Dolchich is a drop. Deuce Vaughn could definitely be dropped. Gibson, I would hold on to as well. I know he didn't get any touches, but I, I feel like more often than not, we probably will see at least like a 60-40 backfield split between B-Rob and Gibson, despite B-Rob dominating him. Deonta Foreman is kind of just like a random RBBC. I would rather have Roshan Johnson than Deonta Foreman. So Schultz, Schultz is interesting. Like he kind of stinks. But he ran the single most routes out of all tight ends this week. Like, no tight end ran more routes than Dalton Schultz did. And if we're chasing the usage, he's the guy to chase. I just, like, never really liked him. I thought he was a system guy in 
Dallas. So Quentin Johnson at Tennessee, I'd hold on to Quentin Johnson for I I'd probably he's one of those dudes that I, I kind of assumed was going to be a later breakout for the year anyway. So if you drafted him, you had to kind of known that. So I'd hold on to Johnson. I'd hold, I'd hold on to Zach Charbonnet, Evan Hall. You could drop Damian Harris. You could always have dropped Elijah Mitchell. You can drop. I, I would hold on to him if I'm a C-Mac owner, though. Yeah, th those are the dudes I'm getting rid of, though. All right, so that's what we got for the waiver wire. Turns out this format is so goddamn long. I'm sorry. This this ran on. But let me know if you like this format. This format will end up being longer. I know that if I'm consuming waiver wire content, I'm probably looking to get it on the shorter side. I don't know if I want to watch a goddamn 30-minute waiver wire video. Sorry about that. Would you rather just be regular where I kind of just rank the guys and list them off? Or would you rather me do this type of beat each week? Let me know in the comments. Sign up for Underdog Fantasy. They're giving you a very free square. 0.5 total yard square. If you use promo code BDGE when you sign up, deposit 10 bucks, promo code BDGE, you'll have $20 to play with, plus a free square 0.5 yards. I know some of y'all took the Aaron Rodgers over 0.5 yards, total yards last night, and he didn't hit it, but underdog marked it as a win for everybody because they're good fucking people. And when you support good people, you're a good person. So support them, and then that supports us. What else supports us? Hitting the like, commenting down below, subscribe to the channel if you're new, and we will see you tomorrow for our trade targets video. Thank <laughs> you.